Wow, I think I've been off the grid most of my life. <laughs> I've had to reinvent myself over and over again, reimagine. Unordinary is one of my favourite words. And I think after a lifetime of, of cricket and football and, and television and radio, that the one enduring legacy that I've got is my nickname. Tangles. I'm a great lover of words and language. And I suppose if we just lose the T off tangles, then we end up with angles. Look at that. Now that seems pretty appropriate to me because with my bowling action, right arm over left ear, old legs crossed at the point of delivery, biomechanically perfect. I was biomechanically perfect before it was even a word. <laughs> Very hard to be good looking and pretty on your feet. And I rest my case, really. <laughs> but also uh, in architecture, T-squares, young people might say, what's a T-square and a set square? But, but ink and pencil and papers, um, my love affair with a blank sheet of paper, I suppose you would say. But a little juxtaposition of one letter, say the letter E, and all of a sudden you go from angles to angels. Seems pretty scary coming from an old fast bowler, doesn't it really? But that's where I'd like to start today. I'd like to talk to you about character angels people that come into our life and they change the way that you act and think and believe and talk forever. I reckon if I said to each and every one of you, are there three or four people visibly that have come into your life and they've had a massive impact? Look at that. I think I've got a couple of heads nodding out there. There are so many invisible character angels out there, whether you're successful or not. A whole raft of people that have had a massive impact on us. I couldn't even begin to reciprocate the, the love and wisdom direction that I've been given right around the world by all sorts of people that have helped shape who I am today. Now, not all of those angels are the sort of characters that pat you on the back and say, look, you can do anything, go out there, grab it, and create your own future. Some of them are a little more confrontational. Norm Smith was my first AFL coach. Wow. Voted AFL, VFL coach of the century. Imagine a guy like that coming into your life. He travelled to Hobart to get a signature on a piece of paper so that I could play football for the Melbourne Football Club. Home ground, the MCG, huge grey concrete coliseum, 100,000 fans, three levels of humanity screaming their lungs out. Wow, you got to get a little bit of excitement there, haven't you? And so isn't it incredible when someone comes into your house or vice versa, your relationship with them changes forever. That big word trust comes into play, doesn't it? And he was smart, emotionally very intelligent, Norm Smith, because he said to me, in my lounge room, on the banks of the River Derwent, he said, don't think you're coming to Melbourne if you don't matriculate. Did I matriculate? Yes. <laughs> and as he left my place through the door, um, he put his arm around me and all of a sudden he said to me, you know what? I reckon you'll make it in VFL footy. No one had ever said to me that I would in fact make it in VFL footy. You got no idea how good that made me feel. And of course, we had a, <clears throat> a bit of a barbecue organised. And I'll talk about my dad, Big Max, in a moment. He popped up. You, know, you can never trust him. He's always popping in and out of the, the screen there. Um, but with Norm Smith, um, it, it was was incredible because, you know, all of a sudden I'd, I'd come to, to Melbourne and um, played cricket for the Melbourne Cricket Club. Um, his son Peter was in the same team. We played a couple of games together. The second game we won. We had a celebration. I'll be honest, Peter and I had, in fact, maybe too many. 
And, and you know what it's like? You know, when you actually, you're in a room, in a place, and you think, gosh, I shouldn't be there. And Norm's, um, Norm's wife, uh, Marge, she, she was having a, an enormous conversation with Peter. You know, gee, I just didn't want to be there. And the next morning, I wake up, Pete's distressed. Bang, tears out the back door. Normally, you'd go with your mate, wouldn't you? You'd get a hand on the doorknob. Norm Smith, the red-headed bloke, he's sitting there. Red and white fleck table. Everyone's mum had them, bullnose, aluminium trim, matching chairs. He said, pull up a chair, son. And of course, I pull up a chair. I haven't eyeballed him yet. I'm watching the grouts go round and round. And then he started the for and against having a drink. He said, you'll let yourself down, your mum down, your sister down. You've let Southern Tasmania, the Friends School, the North Hobart Cricket Club <laughs> and the Melbourne Footy Club and you haven't even been to practice yet. <laughs> but he said, you're big enough and ugly enough to make up your own mind. He said, we'll never discuss this matter again. And uh, I suppose I didn't drink for the next five years and I can trace back to that moment, that meeting, that conversation, uh, it was critical in my career as a footballer and a cricketer. I think any success that I had, I owe a lot of it to that character angel in Norm Smith. Then there was another one, my old man, Big Max. She was, uh, not all of us can actually say that their dad um, or their mum, they're good mates with. But I was lucky. My dad was not only a, a great father, but he was also uh, a good mate. And sometimes, you know, in that conversation about Norm Smith before, you know, you get excited and you need these character angels there. But when I was in Hobart, four or five of my sphere of influence said to me, Maxie, who do you think you are? What, you're going to Melbourne, the mainland, as we call Australia, and you're going to be a VFL footballer? You're going to be a test cricketer and an architect? You're joking. They're dream takers. No one has a right to say to you that you'll be a no talent. You'll never amount to anything. You'll embarrass yourself. They are dream takers. Part of today's conversation is, is turning you know, the dream takers in the dream makers, and my dad was there. Gosh, I, I used to dream of owning my own green baggy cap. I could feel the fingers over the green baggy. I, I could run my hand over the gold braid. I could smell the freshly cut grass at the MCG and the weight of five and a half ounces of leather in my hand. I finally did get picked to play for Australia, and on the eve of my very first test match, a brown parcel. It's got the blazer, the tie, the cap, a couple of jumpers in it, and I took it home. You've got to share, haven't it? And I walked home. Through that door, my dad and I, my parents split up when I was about 13, and I could have a pity attack and say, poor old me, but life's about what you do to circumstance, how you get back, how you bounce back, what you do. And as I walked through the door, I grabbed the green baggy cap, which incredibly I keep in a brown paper bag. Where else would you keep it? <laughs> and as I walked through that door, I looked across at my dad, Big Max, and there he is. He's got the builder's overalls on. He's got the pencil here, nail bag round here, hammer on the hip, grade one lawnmower haircut, shoot, straight over the top. <laughs> 17 and a half stone, barrel chested, larger than life, enthusiasm plus tax. And I pulled on the green baggie like this. I looked at the old man and I said, what do you think of that? And he said, not bad. <laughs> and then he said, come here, come here, come here, come here. He wants my cap. He's got a bigger head than me. He might stretch it, might tear it. I've not even worn it yet. And you know what? <clears throat> what happens when your dad asks you? You give him the cap. <laughs> And he pulled on the cap like that and he looked back at me and he said, what do you think of that? <laughs> and I said, not bad. <laughs> but when I got in really close, I could see those pale blue eyes well up. The tears rolled down over his cheek. Seemed like eternity before it hit the floor and dissipated. And at that moment, I knew that I wasn't just going to be participating in my dream. When I walked through the gate, onto the hallowed turf of the MCG. 
I was going to be chasing his as well. He was a schoolboy prodigy. He was good enough, but his mum wouldn't let him cross Bass Strait. So he didn't. But to have him looking over my shoulder was just brilliant. Now, not all of your character angels are easy to love first up. Some of them are firebrands. And I suppose we could all relate to this one. Miss Jean Yates, my English teacher. She terrified me. <laughs> I mean, here's a woman, yeah, with, with bright pillar box red painted on pursed lips. And she had <clears throat> rouge, basically supporting these two eyes <laughs> that zoomed in and out in a classroom and occasionally through the window to a distant distraction. Part of the folklore at school was that, that she'd lost her fiancé in a war, tragically killed. I don't know, we'll never know whether or not that's true. But this woman, I mean, she terrified me. One day in class, friends Romans and countrymen, I've come to praise Caesar. And, and I'm stumbling and stammering a little bit there. And straight away, Walker, see me four o'clock outside my office. Maybe then you'll get it right. And I did later on. But she used to bang the books on the table and you'd be jolted out of your daydreaming and you'd come back to the very serious business of English. But incredibly, what she did to me or for me was, was amazing because all of a sudden I was able to, like a beacon, a lighthouse, I fell in love with language. I'd never been able to actually pen books like how to hypnotise chooks how to kiss a crocodile, how to tame lions, or how to puzzle a python if it hadn't been for her. And opening the gate and showing me that you know, on the page you can bring it to life. Nothing better than a big chunky fountain pen with a back ribbon of ink on rice paper to, to bring all of those senses and story together. And I guess she pointed me in the, the direction of storytelling, I suppose very quickly, at a reunion. I was supposed to just say a few words, not mention any teachers, I'm Miss Yates. <laughs> and I mentioned her, she's almost blushed um, at that mention. And later on, how's this, ladies and gentlemen? I've actually <clears throat> walked off stage and this woman in her prime, mid-70s, has hugged me and given me a kiss, these bright red lips <laughs> stuck on the side of my cheek. I thought, I've turned the full circle here. <laughs> The other one that was really important to me, um, and I probably don't look or sound like a, an, an ABC or a radio commentator, but I found myself in a commentary box with a, ba a wonderful guy named Alan McGilvray. And you know, the MCG, Ing. it was a big match. There was West Indies are playing Australia, there's 75,000 people there, it's 45 degrees. And I found myself in what was a little chook house. Corrugated and iron sliding glass windows. And Alan McGilvray's in the front. He's sitting there, he's got the cigarette hanging out of the corner of the mouth. Every time he spoke, the cigarette went up and down like that. Perspiration dripping down onto the chin, down there like that. Tie undone. Next to him is a dear little man named Jack Cameron who was a statistician and on the far side was in fact the expert comments man. And of course, out he comes. I've overtrained, bought a brand new suit for my first day on radio. How about that? <laughs> so as I get in, tangle foot off the short run. One, two, three, four, bang. I've need McGilvray in the back of the head. He's almost swallowed the lighted cigarette, couldn't hit the cough button. The binocs are nearly gone through the glasses and I know he's not happy. Have you ever been in a room like that? All I said was, oh. <laughs> and the lump got bigger and bigger. And, uh, but I sat down on the far end, not before I'd trodden on, on Jack. His life was in three shoe boxes. Green felt pen, red felt pen, blue felt pen. What he's not sure of is in fact in pencil. Stood on that, opened up like a set of crocodile jaws and these cards spewed into the members area at the MCG. 
he's not happy. And I pulled on these old fashioned headphones and all of a sudden stale perspiration stench sort of hung on me. I don't know about you, yuck. I don't like the idea of someone else's perspiration running down the back of my neck. But later on, he said to me, can I give you some advice? I said, Mac. And this is what he said. He said, imagine you're speaking to a whole bunch of blind people. You'll be well on the way to success if in fact you can satisfy their needs. Painted words and word pictures, what a beautiful concept. Yeah, it's engagement, storytelling. That's the glue, our DNA, that makes us engage with one another. He was terrific. And then in a philanthropic sense, my attitude has always been, if you can, then you must. A man came into my life, persistent phone calls. Barry Cooper, founder of Romac, Rotary Overseas Medical Aid for Children. My goodness, the first time I met him um, was up at Bendigo at a function. I was just confronted by herniated brains and, <clears throat> gosh, it was buckled legs, burns. It was incredible, quite confronting, and I'd taken my mum as well. But I suppose one of the many stories, 500 plus, was the Siamese twins. You know, Magdalene, the mum, you know, come out of Abuka, not far from Bougainville in Papua New Guinea. And uh, when the babies were born, septic, in a breech birth, you know what, they just wrapped them up and put them in a supermarket shopping trolley. Then they came to Melbourne, and um, I never forget what the surgeon said in describing the operation, groundbreaking. He said, when I run the scalpel between these two tiny rib cages where they were joined, I could see daylight and blood on that sheet below. He said, then I knew I was participating in a miracle. How many people, how many character angels out there had contributed to get Magdalene down here? She was said, no more, no more children. Another one came, it was a boy. What do you reckon they called the boy? Barry. <laughs> Barry after Barry Cooper. Look, I could, I'm passionate about this. You know, we should. My challenge to you today is to, in fact, you know, become a, a character angel. You know, not a dream taker. Encourage people to grow. Get where their aims might be. Don't underestimate the power of character angels. You know, to shut down all of those voices that say that you can't. As I said, so many have contributed to my life along the way. And I suppose if I could just leave you with that challenge and say that <clears throat> you will and can make a difference. That generosity of spirit is awesome. And I suppose finally, if you do, it will, I promise you, energise your soul. Thank you. <laughs>